This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making from two Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. Happy New Year, Ben. Welcome to 2022. Happy New Year. Another year, and once again, we have an unbelievable guest to kick off the new year. I mean, this has been a real joy to meet all kinds of really interesting people, but today we get we had a chance to talk with John Mac McQuown, and Mac is an absolute true giant in in the world of, of modern finance. He's probably best known for having created the first equity index fund. And even that, just let that sink in. He's behind the creation of the first equity index fund back in the 60s. It's, it's an absolutely mind-blowing statement. And, and, and as you'll hear in the interview, he's has his fingerprints over all kinds of other really fascinating things. Uh, fingerprints everywhere. But I, I mean, even with the, the, the first institutional index fund, like we've kind of told this story before, the, 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 the first institutional index fund wasn't started by, by Bogle. But one of the things we learned talking to Mac is that Bogle's first index fund, Mac and, and the work that he was doing at Wells Fargo were also heavily involved with, with that. Yeah. Anyways, he's a self-professed, uh, I think he said in one interview I saw, calls himself a data dog. And as he said at the end of the conversation, you know, the, the data will sort that out. The data sorted out so much in, in, in modern finance. And, and he was so intrigued by what he didn't know. And he just followed the data through all these evolutions and, frankly, revolutions in, in modern finance. Like, think about it. When he started, there was no performance of an index available. You couldn't tell what the S&P 500 had earned. It's There's unbelievable. Not, not, Things no we doubt. take for granted today did not exist. And since it did not exist, there were no real principles around portfolio management. It was stories. It is absolutely wild what him and his colleagues at the time created. Yeah, it is wild. Um, he, he's also been a longtime friend and mentor to David Booth and played a key role in founding Dimensional Fund Advisors. And then at the end, we had a really interesting conversation about uh, his passion for adding some value to improve the climate. Yeah, he's, a, he's an environmentalist. All right, so with that, let's go listen to our conversation with the incredible Mac McLeod. Mac McQuown, welcome to the Rational Reminder Podcast. First off, off the top, Mac, Happy New Year. We're so grateful that you could join us as our kickoff guest for 2022. Well, thank you, Cameron. I'm happy to be here. So let's kick it off with a question about uh, earlier in your finance career. And back then, data certainly was not like data is today. Can you bring us back in time to when you studied finance and the role that data played? Well, data upended the whole topic. When, when I reflect back on the finance I was taught as an, as a, in graduate school, yeah, and with my MBA, I majored in finance and it was for all intents and purposes uh, devoid of data. In large measure, that was because there weren't any really important uh, scaled computers. In fact, when I was in business school, uh, there, there, there were, as far as I can remember, there were no computers whatsoever on campus. And that's not, it was, that, that of course was a long time ago, but if you stop and think about the revolution that got created by computers and data, and the data, of course, followed from computers. And, and, and then, of course, uh, analytical procedures and ideas became uh, uh, the, the quest. And uh, I would say both data and analytical procedures are still at the middle of the quest. Now, they've, it's changed a lot because we've gotten more sophisticated, but in a nutshell, we're still after data and methods of analysis. 
So you went to Wall Street in 1961. You mentioned your studies being relatively devoid of data. What was it like when you got to Wall Street? Well, I was even more devoid of data. Um, as a matter of fact, I have a kind of a funny one about that point. Um, I went to work uh, for a well-known investment banking firm whose name I'll, 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 I'll uh, skip over. Uh, because I, the next point that I want to make is I was questioned by one of the senior execs I was being interviewed by before they offered me a job. And of course, before I accepted it. And his question to me was, why would an engineer want to go to Wall Street? Wow. And, and I'm not joking. That was a question that he was posing me and expected me to say something. Well, um, I was already clear from work that I was had been doing uh, across the river from Harvard at MIT that data was going to be that story, and that was just serendipity that I got exposed to that professor and uh, that early data, uh, and the data I'm referring to are uh, weekend. Uh, share price for a collection of 50 initially, and then a couple of hundred stocks on the New York Stock Exchange over a period of quite a number of years. Uh, and if you stop and think about it, that today is kind of the, the holy grail of where analysis goes. And we, and of course, we, we not only have uh, a week, weekly data, we have uh, even hourly data on some equities in from some markets, but we have data from something like 50 markets around the world. And, and I think a lot of that data goes back at least a decade, if not five decades. So just in one lifetime, mine, that game has totally changed. So what level of analysis were the institutions doing in their portfolios at that time? Zero. Zero. They, they weren't even, folk, they, were, they were stock pickers. There, there was next to no uh, level of analysis at the portfolio level for the very simple reason is that they had no framework in which to conduct it. So if I had asked you at that time what the returns were in the S&P 500, you didn't have that, right? No, no. That, that, remember, that came around. Um, Jim, Jim Laurie and Larry Fisher at the University of Chicago persuaded Merrill Lynch to collect data on uh, the New York Stock Exchange from 1926 to 1960. And that was initially monthly data. Uh, and that was the first data set. And there were something like 600 companies in, in that set. And that data was, a, was built into a database by Larry Fisher, and it was available in roughly 1963. And one of the first people that I met who were studying that data was Gene Fama who, by the way, is still one of my partners, right? Or vice versa, depending on how you want to look at that. But if you look at the, look at the puzzle uh, of the period prior to that available, that data, there was no data analysis. Hmm. So now you, you started looking at institutional portfolios analytically. What did you find? What did you find when you started doing that? Well, guess what? <laughs> they, they were under diversified and in a nutshell their performance especially if you got around to risk adjusting it was considerably worse than that than just the s p 500 i mean like considerably especially especially if you were risk adjusting it because they were so both portfolios were so under diversified when I first joined a major banking firm, uh, there, there were 
three and four hundred million dollar portfolios invested in twenty five stocks. Hmm. I mean, uh, today that would be a criminal offense. Yeah. So, so you ended up at Wells Fargo, and Wells Fargo Management Sciences was started. Can you talk about who worked with you there? Well, uh, yeah, that's actually that's actually a really uh, curious story for sure. I, I mentioned already that I was uh, f uh, fussing with data as kind of really I was a uh, keep I was collecting data out of Barrons and punching it in and uh, in, into um, uh, cards, key cards, and and reading them into a computer. And the, the professor that was had me doing that was at MIT, not at Harvard. And, and I volunteered to do that to learn something. So I had been fussing around with that data. And, and I was beginning to look at the statistical behavior of that data. I mean, I, don't, I was already trained in engineering, right? Data was nothing new to me. And when I went to New York on Wall Street, uh, this professor from MIT uh, and a couple of colleagues, one of whom I knew quite well, uh, started to put together a company that would attempt to utilize that kind of data to, to manage a portfolio. And it was one of the really first attempts to manage a portfolio with data. And so I got recruited uh, by those guys to sort of fuss around with the data as I had been when I was at Harvard on nights and weekends when I was on Wall Street. And I be, it became apparent to one of the senior people at IBM, the data center where at, at, at the data center was at 51st and 6th Avenue in the floor, in the basement of the Time Life building. Hmm. Wow. And one day he said to me, what, so what is this stuff that you're doing? And I said, well, you know, it's, I'm just doing what I'm told. And in essence, it's proprietary to some professors and so forth. I wouldn't, didn't reveal anything. Well, he carried that message to a colleague of his at MIT, at, at, excuse me, at, at MIT, at uh, IBM. And I met that person uh, on one of my weekend jaunts at the data center running data. And he said to me, this is really interesting stuff. What can you tell me about it? So I clued him in a little bit about it. And about a month or whatever later, he invited me to San Jose to give a talk on data analysis, just kind of in the abstract sense, before a, a group of banking executives. Well, who was in the audience? Answer, among others, of course, the chairman of Wells Fargo, Ransom Cook. Right. So Ransom comes up to me afterwards and he says, uh, I would like to have a chat with you about this topic. Are you gonna be around for a couple of days? And I said, well, I'm gonna be around tomorrow. And he says, can you come to my office? Which I did. And I go into his office and, and without any hesitation at all, he says, you know, I would actually like to see that work extended. How about coming to work for me? That was, that was like the, the first 50 words out of his mouth. I, I, if you don't think I could have been knocked over by a noodle, you could have, I was easily astonished. So I go back to New York and tell this to my wife and uh, that, that didn't draw a particularly broad smile. <laughs> She was in the MBA program at, at Columbia at the time. And then Mr. Cook uh, persisted in a couple of phone calls and he got me to come back to San Francisco and meet several of his lieutenants. And it made me a, a, a very attractive offer. He asked me how much I was making a month and I told him. And he said, he tripled it and said, suppose we, we have that as your starting salary. Well, I mean, uh, come on, right? Triple what I was making in one shot. Um, so I, I left New York and went to San Francisco with a reluctant wife. And 
and and started uh, working on on this stuff, which included mostly included uh, uh, hiring a variety of people to actually do the really difficult work, which I explained to Mr. Cook, I was really only capable of doing some. And he was very agreeable with that idea. So, you know, in the final analysis, we made deals with a number of consultants and or their advisors, which means the more senior professors, mostly at Chicago, but also at MIT and Stanford. And within a, within a few years, we had uh, 11 different academic, 11 or 12 different academics working on the problem. And mostly what, what I was responsible for was the team that I had as a staff uh, working on the data. And the professors were the ones who were designing the experiments. Hmm. Well, uh, if you fast forward to today, six of those 11 professors have Nobel prizes. So it was a perfect storm. And how the hell did that happen? Pure unadulterated serendipity. <laughs> the generating function of the universe, I'm fond of pointing out. <laughs> wow. Now, now we understand that at Wells Fargo, you were given an unlimited budget, which is somewhat unheard of, I think. Uh, why do you think that they were so supportive of, of this quantitative approach? It, it, it wasn't really they, Ben. It was him. It was the oh, chairman. Okay. I was, my, my budget was taken out of the system and it was the, was the chairman's budget. Hmm. And he alone made up his mind how much was going to get spent. So whenever I had a request for uh, some what amounted to some more money. Uh, I went to the chairman and uh, never once in the 10 years I worked for him and his, his successor was it turned down. Hmm. You know, he said to me one day, you know, look at all the money we spend on systems and computers and all this stuff. And all we're doing is the same thing we did in the 1930s with punch cards and green shades and eye bands, arm bands. We, we, if we can't do something more than that, I don't know why we have these fancy computers. That's honestly what he, that's his point of view. Wow. Well, guess what? There were a lot of, he had a lot of, um, a lot of his lieutenants were not that happy about it, but a few were. But he, he, uh, he stood up to it all, all the, all the way. And there were, there were a couple of his successor, chairman successor too was, was a big devotee of what we were doing and, and the same kind of analysis. And he was, he was very instrumental in populating a, a lot of effort at Wells Fargo around and data analysis. Hmm. But remember, this was the beginning of a perfect storm. We, we, Wells was not the only place, but it was among the first, that's for sure. So what were some of the results of that incredible brain trust? Well, obviously, the most probably the most important single one was uh, index funds. Um, pretty hard to pretty hard, hard to under under under, under <laughs> underscore the significance of, uh, of index funds. Uh, or, or more, if you want to say it much more generally, passive management. Uh, but there were quite a few other things too. I mean, uh, there were several people who were interested in automated um, credit analysis and, and uh, retail credit scores. And we, we uh, worked on the development of retail credit scores that was subsequently picked up by Fair Isaacs mm -hmm. because Bill Fair was a good friend of the chairman. Well, uh, you've heard of FICO scores, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we had, we had some things along that line working before FICO existed. Another another one I think that was interesting was um, uh, the what became known as Mastercard, and to, and, and was at the time called Master Charge. 
And, and the whole idea was to try to move uh, small consumer credit away from monthly payment loans, which was the predominant uh, form of the lending at the time. Uh, but monthly payment loans were opposite a given asset. They weren't open-ended credit. And I would say that the creation of open-ended credit, which, which we did, certainly did not invent, but we were among the first to subscribe to that idea. And our chairman was the first uh, to persuade his, uh, several of his colleagues to form a consortium to form MasterCard or MasterCharge. That was, that, I mean, if you really stop and think about the implications of that. Uh, of course, American Express was already there, right? But the banks, uh, the banks uh, it came second in that race. Hmm. Wow. It was, it was, as I said, it was a perfect storm. I mean, I think another one of the really significant lines of inquiry had to do with uh, how do you measure the profitability of a bank branch? There were no models uh, of that question. They were just expanding the branch network kind of willy nilly. I mean, that's unkind, but I'm, I don't mean it quite that uh, whimsically, but the point is there wasn't any analytical procedure for evaluating branch profitability. Hmm. They, they really didn't, couldn't even measure what the value added to the bank was of a, of a bank deposit. Hmm. There, there was just a history of people put in deposits and other people borrowed money and it was loans and deposits, right? But there was no analytical process for connecting the two. But again, I'm not blaming the banks. Remember, there was no computers and no data right. being focused on this kind of thing until just about that same time. So it was. We're, I'm right back to my perfect storm statement. But that's what data did. You asked about the importance of data. There you have it. Wow. So you, you mentioned the index fund being one of the most important th things that came out of the uh, out of the work that you guys were doing what index was the first index fund tracking well uh, well the one that finally ended up in in the actual in an actual portfolio was in fact the S&P 500 but uh, we fussed around with the Dow 30 and of course we recognized quickly that 30 stocks no matter how you choose them is, is going to suffer from under diversification badly. And then of course, the other, uh, the other thing we did a lot at the time was we talked about market portfolios, which was not an index at all. It wasn't a sample of something of a market, it was the entire market. But that was a hard egg to swallow in those days. I mean, today I would say that's kind of the right way to look at the world is to look at the whole market. But when you get really fancy, which, which is not really that fancy, you actually start get, getting into factor analysis. What are, the, what are the risk factors that explain performance? But now we're getting much more sophisticated. I mean, that didn't come up until several years later. But of course, that's where we are today is a factor analysis is pretty much the way the world works. And the question is, what factors do you want to be exposed to? And right. just how efficient, efficient a, a, in a portfolio can you create that's, that's uh, concentrated on a given factor? And of course, the answer is that diversification is far less than the market. So in many respects, we're right back to market portfolios. I don't think we can overstate how big a deal it was that you guys created the first index portfolio. Like, did, how big an idea was it? Like, did you know you were onto something that big, that transformative? Are you kidding? We, 
we we knew you know all you have to do is start looking at the data carefully but that implies you have data and that implies that you have somebody financing the, the look so i'm always very inclined to give this the 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 guys who ran the bank, Wells Fargo, as much as, as much credit as the, the people doing the analysis, because if they wouldn't have signed on to spending that money, it would never have happened. Wow. So we, we talked earlier about institutions that just didn't have data and, and the, the whole portfolio management process sounds like it was pretty subjective. And you mentioned stock picking. How did institutions respond when you show up with data and with this concept of an index fund? Well, I would say that there were two poles of response, horrified and intrigued. Uh, hmm. The whole world revolved around stock picking in those days. I mean, what, what, what was what were the the firms on Wall Street doing in those days? They were selling stock. They weren't selling portfolios. Stop and think about that. Hmm. Also, remember it wasn't that much earlier than that when 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 mutual funds actually came to the fore. I mean, we 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 had mutual funds going back a long way, but they weren't very popular. Uh, I mean, it was in the was in the, the really the late the late four between the late forties and the late fifties that uh, mutual funds began to take off, uh, and you know it was it was uh, it was amazing when you stop and think about it. Um, a couple of one of one of my very close friends from business school went to work for T. Rowe Price. Not exactly why he did. I mean, I don't. I don't really know. I mean, I've. I haven't seen him in many a year, but um, it, it wasn't because of the primacy of portfolios. Uh, it was actually he was hired as the stock picker because hmm. the way they were creating portfolios was was like everybody else. I mean, we're, we're talking about a radical shift. So you're part of creating the first institutional index fund. Uh, Jack Bogle and Vanguard launched the first retail index fund, but that was after what you guys had created. Can you talk about the involvement of Wells Fargo in that story? I know it was mentioned in the book Trillions, which we've talked about a number of times on this podcast. Can you, can you give us firsthand what that story is? Well, um, what, one, of the, one of the most important things that our chairman uh, wanted, he referred to it as a, a portfolio that was safe to sell in branches. And and of course, what today we would say is it would have to be an incredibly well diversified portfolio, or the S and P five hundred is a pretty good proxy for that. But there was no such thing as an S and P five hundred fund in those days. Well, um, if you if you look at um, the story of banking. You're struck by Glass Eagle of 1933 when uh, the Congress, in its infinite stupidity, separated investment banking from commercial banking because they thought that was the source of the problem that created the Depression, which, of course, was very far from fact. But it was a convenient scapegoat. Hmm. So what that meant was that banks could not deal in stocks, and that meant individual stocks or portfolios to the public. 
if it was in a trust, the banks had a monopoly on trusts, but Wall Street had a monopoly on agency accounts. Now, does that make any sense at all? Of course, it makes none. But that separation of church and state was an enormous factor in uh, what do I want? What do I want to call the innovation that closed that gap and invalidated the Glass Steagall Act? But it wasn't for several odd years, a decade or two later, that mm -hmm. that the Glass Steagall actually didn't get um, rescinded. But you know, I'm very critical of uh, of that kind of regulation because it's not predicated on data analysis, either before the fact or after the fact. They just implement that kind of regulation and they don't examine the consequences. Well, when it comes to financial analytics or financial analysis in general, you better be prepared to do your homework. And today, of course, and, and it wasn't in 1933, there, there were no computers at all, zero. And there was even less data, but today it's inexcusable to have a regulation of financial intermediation that doesn't consider the consequences and study them. But that is, remember, that's just a change in mindset, which accompanies a change in technology. So in some sense, you can't blame those guys. They just didn't know. So you're un unable to bring an index product to the bank branches. That's what caused the conversation with, with Jack Bogle at the time? The chairman said to me, if we can't sell these portfolios in the branches, somebody has to be able to sell them age on an agency basis. And we had a lawyer in New York who was a former SEC commissioner that was working with us to get funds registered and we actually got funds registered uh, at the SEC even though we were a bank uh, it was in a bank holding company framework and he said to me after we ran into this snafu well I know one person who's interested in this topic Jack Vogel so I went to Valley Forge with Dick and um I'll leave his name out by the way, but uh, we went to Valley Forge and we had a conversation with Jack. He, he was already thinking about the same thing. We were just further along that, that path. I mean, I mean, I mean, if he were alive, he could defend himself, but uh, maybe he was as far along as we were, but we were pretty far along by then. So I, I took that back to the chairman and, and, and told him what I had discovered in my conversation at Valley Forge. And he said, well, go help him. Somebody needs to do this. Wow. And that of course is what turned out to be the Vanguard S&P 500 fund, right? I, I'm just curious, Mac, did, because I had read that Jack Bogle was a proponent of active management, but kind of changed through time. Like where was he in that evolution when you met him and did you have to do any convincing? I, I would say that he was largely persuaded already that active management wasn't delivering its promise. But like a lot of other people, I mean, like, like Ransom Cook, the chairman of Wells, that was his intuition was that was the was exactly the same. The trust department was creating portfolios that were not well diversified. And of course, the point of the matter is it wasn't being represented as being well diversified either. That diversification was not the raison d'etre of portfolio management in those days. It was stock picking. It, it's, it's amazing. But bear in mind, uh, the world is round. 
but for a long time we didn't realize that. I mean, it's a, it, when you stop and think about the the revelation that that flatness versus roundness gave rise to, that's mm -hmm. about the same scale of understanding that arose in the equity markets in those days, right? And, I, and the flat landers and the flat earthers, I mean, you don't, you don't want to take them to the guillotine. That, that's, not a, that's not a fair treatment. They didn't get the picture. But an awful lot of people didn't get the picture for a hell of a long time, right? So it sounded like w when you talked about you, you were kind of sent off to go help Bogle get this thing off the ground. Did Wells have a financial interest in this, or was this just kind of a we have to get this thing out? He Ransom wanted to get it. Well, Dick. By that time, it was Dick. Dick Cooley. He he he. Those two guys saw the importance of the idea. And and if Wells couldn't do it because of Glass Steagall, somebody needed to do it. And there was somebody out there called Jack Bogle who wanted to do it. Wow. And there's and and our, our counsel at, at Davis Polk in New York knew him. They they he worked the, the counsel worked for both firms and openly. And you know, that was un, well understood by both of us. So why shouldn't we be collaborative? We got blocked by by law, by Congress. And I always go back to the same point. I mean, Congress didn't understand anything, but I don't, I don't think that's very uncommon, right? There, there's all kinds of regulation that arises out of, out of special interests and lack of understanding and lack of data. I mean, much, much less so today than it was 50 years ago, but it's still prevalent. Okay, so you got your fingerprints on the Vanguard taking off with indexing. But meanwhile, back at Wells Fargo, there was something still going on that through the years was a seed, or at that time was a seed to what is now iShares, correct? Yes. And what was that? Well, um, re remember the, the difference between an ETF and a mutual fund. What is the crucial difference? The crucial difference is in a mutual fund to value a unit that is a mutual fund share, at the end of every day, they add up the value of the assets and divide by the number of units. So there's a, a new unit value in a mutual fund every day. Well, a mutual fund is just a share in a company. There's no reason why the share in that company couldn't be traded continuously in an open market. Right. And by the way, there was such a thing too. It was called closed end funds. Mm -hmm. they, there weren't a lot of them, but they existed for sure. In fact, they go way back. They actually they precede by quite a bit mutual funds in terms of their prominence. Well. If, if, if that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do also, because if the shares are trading at a price that's different than the value of the asset, there's an arbitrage. And the, the fund management company can actually issue more shares or redeem shares or whatever. And it could, it could remove the, the disparity between the net asset value per share and the market price of that. So there's no reason why that couldn't be done. So it became increasingly apparent that that was gonna take place by one means or another. So what's an ETF? That's all, what, that's all an ETF actually is. Mm -hmm. it, it's just an open-end fund that, that has a shares competitively traded in an auction market rather than 
uh, traded uh, at the net asset value at the end of the day. It's much more sensible. There's no reason for, in fact, another one of the things that's pretty interesting is having a conventional mutual fund with ETFs also in the same portfolio. I mean, of course, it wouldn't last very long, right? Because the arbitrage would take care of that. But when you get right down to it, it's just another artifact of history that had to be learned and adapted to the implications of the learning. So what's an iShare? It's an ETF. Well, so we launched those things too. And of course it got picked up. And today it's owned by BlackRock, but I mean, I, we know those guys, I know personally those guys very well. And I mean, Fred Grauer was a very good friend of mine or is a very good friend of mine. Uh, and he was, the, he was the, uh, the intermediary between Wells Fargo Investment Advisors and their acquisition by, by a, a pair of companies. And of course it ends up at, at, uh, uh, at BlackRock. But, mm -hmm. When you get right down to it, I mean, that's a perfectly reasonable way of looking at the world. And little by little, reason prevailed. Incredible story. Earlier, you used uh, flat earthers as an analogy for um, people believing in active management. Now, there, there are still flat earthers around today. <laughs> uh, you started this index fund, or you were involved in starting this index fund revolution 50 years ago. And it's, it's reshaped portfolio management uh, and, and tons of assets are shifting, but tons of assets are still in active funds. Why do you think that is? Hope springs eternal. I think a lot of people who are invested in equities start out with uh, uh, owning shares in, in a company that, that they have participated in the management of and that company goes public and they still own shares. And slowly but surely, they're trying to figure out how to diversify if they're smart enough. And, but there's a, there's a residual uh, psychology around owning the sh a share of a company. And, and, I, and, and the conclusion of portfolio level reasoning uh, is self-evident to those of us who think about it all the time, including you two guys, but it's not evident to everybody. Now, uh, how, how long will it take before it is evident to everybody? One more generation, two more generations, five more generations? I don't know, but that's where it's going asymptotically, right? Little by little, it's converging on that conclusion. So you were on the ground with David Booth when, you know, Dimensional was founded. Can you talk about the original concept and what about that idea? We know David talks about ideas. What was so compelling about that idea at the time? Well, David and I, you know, David and I go back to the beginning of time, right? Um, David and I both saw something important. Uh, and more, not 100%. Uh, independently, but maybe pretty close to independently. And that is that portfolios, institutional portfolios were dominated by large stocks. And if you stop and think about it, that's not unreasonable, right? Because that's where all the bulk of the money is in the big stocks. Mm -hmm. uh, but that just says that the small stocks are, are uh, under being under accumulated in institutional portfolios. And the obvious answer to that is to create a portfolio of small stocks. So that's what we did. That was the uh, foundation garment of dimensional. Well, I mean, you know what? It's, that's not rocket science. That's just lo simple logic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I can tell you right now that there were a lot of people out there at the very beginning who didn't hear it very well. But once they got the picture, they got it. And it, it's, uh, and of course today, um, 
we we think about we think about it more in the factor sense than we do in the large versus small sense. But size is a factor, but it's not the only one. And when you get right down to it, risk is even more important than than size. But but uh, size and risk are correlated too, or are inversely correlated. The, the bigger the company, the, the less risk it has. But that doesn't go to zero when you get very large, right? Quite the contrary. It, it actually, again, asymptotically approaches the market as a whole. So you, when all is said and done, you, it, it's not a very complicated picture. It's just the, the learning curve that everybody has to proceed along until they get the picture. So D Dimensional started on the, on the basis or the premise of, of a kind of like a small cap index fund, but we, we understand that Dimensional doesn't really make index funds. So could, could you try and explain the difference between a Dimensional fund and an index fund? Well, an, an index fund is strictly speaking, has its distribution of weights over the composition of the 500 stocks or whatever that is given by uh, uh, you, usually the amount of shares outstanding in that company. But of course, it could be something else too. You know, I, I, we were fussing around with equal weighted indexes at one time. Uh, and that there's, a, you, I, there's a relatively short course in why that doesn't work. But the point of the matter is, um, uh, markets are moving around a lot. Depending, and a lot of it has to do what I would call uh, not only just fads. There's some of that for sure. But where where are where's the new money coming from? It's coming from small stocks, right? When when IPOs occur, I mean nowadays you know you can have a a hundred billion dollar IPO. Elon Musk has that experience, but that wasn't very common not long ago. I mean, if a, if a company came to market for the first time, you know, 50 or 100 million of market cap would be uh, not uncommon. Well, um, so there's, there's a lot of dynamism in the, in, the, in the composition of shares, not just prices. Companies are buying back shares, there are mergers, there are spinoffs. There's all kinds of stuff going on at the corporate level. So there's a lot of corporate finance going on, not, not just financial economics. So the combination of those considerations leads to the idea that you've got to have some kind of a intellectual understanding of the flow of shares themselves. So we got onto that point uh, in the early days at Dimensional. And uh, well, we had, we had some of that vision at, at Wells too. And I don't, I'm not saying that Wells alone had that vision. There were others that did too, but the point of the matter is that um, you, can, you can look at the world of um, shares just like the world of prices. And then you've got the dynamics of the way funds are flowing. So new, new shares are in open-end funds, new shares are being issued with regularity. Um, so the float is also a consideration, right? So the shares being currently traded, because a, lo a lot of shares have been immobilized in portfolios that don't move no matter what. So there's a lot of dynamism in the number of shares going on, on uh, into or out of a market. And, you know, just look at the IPO world in, in the last couple of decades. I mean, it's been, it's been a lot of IPOs in the last couple of decades. So it, it's just the same old story. It's a learning curve that, that we've been ascending sort of step by step. And every time we find a, what we think is a new step, what we discover there's a, a new dimension.
one of the things that we hear is a concern about indexing, just as it continues to grow, is that it could potentially get too big and start distorting market prices or, or governance with companies. And I think Bogle had this concern as well before he passed. Do you have any concerns about indexing getting too big? Well, it's somewhere around 40 to 50% of the market now, but not strictly speaking, indexing passive would be a better way to put it. And passive, passive doesn't necessarily follow the number of shares outstanding. Um, yes, I think that's a concern, Ben, but I, I, I wouldn't number it among my top 10 concerns. Um, I think the danger is on the other side of that coin. I mean, I think it, it not not going far enough is is uh, is a bigger concern than too far. Hmm. Do you have any concerns about factor premiums going away as they become more and more popular? Well, that's a very good question, Cameron. That's got there's some deep deep roots in that question. Remember, factor analysis is partially imagination at work because you have to imagine a factor before you start looking for one unless you do just flat out um, data analysis, analysis of variance of that. Mm -hmm. and, and we do a lot of that these days at that dimensional and we're not the only ones that just looking empirically at what factors, factors show their heads. Uh, and when you when you start looking at the Tokyo first section uh, or the, or the EMEA uh, or the whatever you know you you find different factors right it, it, you can extract different concentrations as it were some of that is a function of the nature of the markets that were formed I mean it's not surprising that certain countries have companies that are dominated in certain minerals because that's been their comparative advantage. I mean, that they, not everybody mines gold, but when you get right down to it, um, we, we're all examining the world through the lens of factors. It's just a question of how far down that road you, you let the analysis run and my feeling is the data will sort that out. And I think there are plenty of people that are of that same mind. Hmm. You, you've made significant contributions to, to finance, um, which we and our clients benefit from. You're also an environmentalist. What, what practical steps do you think people can be taking in their day-to-day -day lives to combat things like climate change? Well, that's a whole another book, uh, Ben. Uh, that's, you know, at Stone Edge Farm, as you may be aware, we've created a microgrid where 100% of the power that we consume, I mean, you see all the lights on here, it's all coming from the sun. We haven't been connected to the local utility since uh, the 20th of December, 2019. Hmm. And my marginal cost of electricity is zero because it hmm. comes from the sun. My marginal carbon footprint is also zero because it comes from the sun. The problem with carbon is it's, it has a big residual effect to dump CO2 into the atmosphere and it lives there for somewhere between hundreds and thousands of years. And, it, it, and uh, it's not new news that uh, CO2 is a, is a insulating blanket that surrounds the planet and it prevents re-radiation of the incoming sun's rays from uh, radiating back out into space and blocks the air and the infrared. Um, and I think the basis of the understanding that I have and my colleagues have that have been working on this traces to those simple set of facts. But the truth of the matter is uh, solar panels, um, like one of my professor friends at, at MIT points out, the cost of a photocell 
has come down 98.6% wow. per KW hmm. in the last three decades. And he says it's going to go down another 90%. Well, for all intents and purposes, photocells are free. What's not free is the structure that holds them. And then, of course, you have to hook them up. It takes, you know, you gotta, you gotta think about the systemic aspect of it, not just the photocells. So we're really big on the idea of storing energy in the form of hydrogen. Not just batteries, but I'm very fond of pointing out that if you take a cubic foot of batteries, the best ones on the planet, versus a cubic foot of hydrogen at 3,500 PSI, the amount of energy in the hydrogen is 1,000 times the energy in the, in the battery. And we have no limit on the amount of hydrogen there is available. Hmm. We have definite limits on how much uh, the components, electronic components of a battery, plus the fact they're not at the margin free. Mm -hmm. I mean, decomposing water uh, is not free either, but it, it's extremely efficient relative to other means of getting hydrogen. Well, the world is wake world is waking up to all this stuff now. Sure is. So, Mac, our final. Question for you. How do you define success in your life? <laughs> um, all it does is really amplify my curiosity. I mean, of course, it creates wealth, too. I'm not denying that point, but when I, when I think about what we don't know, I'm more intrigued than I am by what we do know. I think, I think and I'm, I'm, very, I'm very fond of pointing this out, I'm not very enthusiastic about the political system. And by that, I, I don't mean the American political system, I mean all political systems. They, there's no accountability. It's not a data generated process. Hmm. Look at what we've learned in financial economics because we've got data. We, we create, we human beings create regulations, implement regulations, and we don't set about studying the consequences. The first major regulation to have its consequences studied is yet to occur. I'm not a very big fan of that. Well, Mac, this has been an incredible hour. I want to thank you so much. You've been very gracious with your time. You've had an incredible career, a huge impact on, on Ben and I and all of our clients. So thank you very much. You're welcome, Cameron. I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you very much, Ben. Thanks, Mac. This was great. Enjoy yourself. Likewise. Thank you. This is great. Bye-bye.